All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I know we still have some people signing in, but welcome to uh, our regular Master Gardener Lecture Series program. Today we have Susan Nugent with us, and she's going to speak all about attracting wildlife to your landscape, and she's one of our regular presenters, and we're very glad that she was able to come in and join and speak with us today. Um, just a couple housekeeping items. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, because it's much easier for the Master Gardeners to be able to help answer those questions within that Q&A. Um, but we'll still monitor the chat box as well, but please put all questions in the Q&A. And some of the questions we might be able to even uh, ask Susan and she can answer them live. And we'll still have time at the end where we can answer some additional questions. Um, and then as part of security purposes, nobody has the ability except for the panelists to share their microphone as well as their camera, but um, you can still communicate directly to the panelist. But anyways, thank you all very much for joining us today. And Susan, thank you very much for stepping in and helping do this presentation with us. Thank you, Taylor. Um, I thought I should start by admitting that I've had a an evolving relationship with wildlife. Uh, I started gardening in New Hampshire and there my garden was overwhelmed by woodchucks. I wondered, do I really want wildlife in my garden? I certainly didn't want the woodchucks. And then I moved to the Florida Keys. And in the Florida Keys, the key deer were constantly in my backyard and going through uh, chewing everything that they could. But I absolutely fell in love with the key deer. And I think it is the key deer that has changed my entire relationship with uh, wildlife in the garden. Because there was nothing better than waking up in the middle of the night and hearing those key deer crunching across the pea stone in my backyard. And I learned that I needed to build some uh, barriers around my native trees, but we survived and I came to love wildlife. But not all of you may like the same wildlife that I'm talking about. And I think when we talk about attracting wildlife, we really have to think about which ones, which wildlife we wish to attract and which we don't. I just wanted to thank um, Taylor Clem and Wendy Wilbur. I'm using some of their slides today, and I have a number of photos from my backyard. So um, you've got three different uh, visions going on here, which at times may interrupt your flow of thought or your, so just ask. If you have a question, ask. So what wildlife do you want to attract? Uh, and that question keeps coming up over and over. Um, some people very much want snakes in their backyard, while others do not. Some people like moles because they know they uh, eat nematodes, but others hate moles because, oh, it makes the grass unattractive. So we really have to define what we want, what you want in your backyard. These are two. Now, the one on the left, the um, Cooper's Hawk is uh, something that I don't want, but it's part of nature. And that was one thing that I had to adjust to is that wildlife will take care of wildlife. And uh, this hawk took a mockingbird straight out of my yard and proceeded to digest it, tear it apart. It took an hour took a full hour for this hawk to take out all the feathers and to eat as much of um, the mockingbird as he wanted. And that's part of nature. Now on the right hand side is one of those fellows that I'm not so happy to see. And yet at every campground that I've ever camped at, people are trying to get raccoons into their campground. So some people love raccoons. You can see this guy is, or maybe you can't figure out what he's doing, but he's climbing my bird feeder. And so he, right now he's eating the suet out of my bird feeder. So that was a problem that I had to solve. And with the help of Wild Birds Unlimited, I got another baffle onto my uh, bird feeder, which keeps raccoons out. But again, think about who you want, and then think about why you want. 
what is it that you really are hoping to gain with wildlife in your yard? Um, I think, as I've said before, for me, um, with the key deer, is wildlife is beautiful. You know, I just love looking at it. I enjoy it. I've gotten to the point where um, I enjoy the wildlife almost as much, well, maybe a little bit more at times, than I enjoy my um, uh, plant garden. Okay? But gardens for wildlife are also beautiful. They provide food and shelter for wildlife, and they add to the greenway. And uh, just to define that greenway a little bit, um, about eight years ago, I was asked by the uh, Museum of Natural History to participate in a project where they were trying to figure out how far away from a green space did one have to live before their garden also contributed to a greenway. So I live roughly a mile as the proverbial crow flies from um, San Falasco. They were trying to decide if my garden would help be better because of San Falasco being a mile away, be the same, or in what ways was I contributing to a greenway? So a greenway is really those connected spaces where wildlife can wander through those or fly through. Um, they were especially interested in pollinators and I'll talk about that more later. So how does my garden add to a greenway, add to that green space, contribute, and thus going on to the next one, promote biodiversity. Now, how much within my little quarter acre can I um, encourage diversity in plant life and in animal life? I think gardens enrich our lives. They certainly have enriched mine. And my garden teaches me yearly about wildlife. Uh, just to, I hope, give you a little chuckle. Last year, I uh, had a deer that started coming just about this time of year. Um, and that deer came every day. I hypothesized, I thought about it, and I decided that was a male deer. Year old, had just been kicked out of his uh, family and was now on his own. Well, he kept coming, he kept coming to the garden uh, practically three times a week, four times a week for about a month. And at the end of the month, he arrived with twins. So all of a sudden he was a she, and she had taught me a lot about how a pregnant uh, deer, a doe who has just given birth, acts and how she keeps those babies separate from people as long as she can. But then I think she really brought her twins to uh, meet me. I'll talk more about her later. I don't know if any of you have seen, um, oh, Darn, the octopus teacher, is that the name of it? The, well, I'm sure you can find it just from those words on uh, Netflix. But the uh, man who tells the story of his relationship with an octopus really learns so much from wildlife. So we don't only learn about wildlife, we can learn from wildlife. And I also like to think that gardeners think Susan, locally. Is that the My Octopus Teacher, the documentary? Yes. Oh, right. thank you. Thank you. I will put the I'll put the IMDB link, <laughs> a unique link that we've shared in our presentation. Oh, I will put that, know. I'll put that in the chat box. <laughs> I love the film. I just I'm absolutely fascinated by the film. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks, Taylor. Um, so I like to think that gardeners think globally and act locally. You know, in terms of having a green way for the world, you know, that's certainly something I can do, but it's a global action. Uh, it helps globally. And certainly the diversity always is a global um, 
consideration. In fact, one of the concerns right now, one of the predictions right now, is that 50% of our present wildlife will no longer exist by the end of this century. And that's scary. And that's really scary. So anything I can do to help keep that from happening as rapidly as they suggest, I want to do. So here are my twins in the upper left hand corner. These are all reg regular visitors to my yard. The squirrel, the brown thrasher, the hummingbird, and a dragonfly. And I really looked at photos of this dragonfly and I can't identify this one. So if somebody would like to identify it, that would be wonderful also. Um, but these are ones that I like in my yard, okay? I also like these. The state um, butterfly, the chickadee. There's a bee on those flowers. You may not be able to see it. And the rabbit, Pro maybe a marsh rabbit. I'm not quite sure on that one. Um, sometimes I don't want that rabbit in my yard. For example, right now I have roughly 200 tomato starts on my deck. My deck is six inches off of the ground. And I really don't want to see that rabbit for quite a bit longer. So he'll be um, welcome later in the year, but not while I've got those starts ready to go. So what do we need to attract wildlife? Air, water, shelter, food. And we'll be going through these a lot and I'll probably say them so many times you'll want to tell me to take time out. But anyway, uh, let's start with air. What affects the air quality in your backyard, right? And yes, folks, I know that is not a native milkweed. However, it is allowed as long as I cut it back in the fall. So I cut those back in the fall so that I don't keep wildlife here. So I let it go where it needs to go on its migration elsewhere. In terms of air quality then, fire certainly affects our um, air quality in the backyard, as well as the whole bottom line. On the left-hand side, now that man has an, a filter that he's breathing through. He's got uh, clothing that protects him from that spray. And he uses the spray on his back, right? I've watched people come in to spray my neighbor's yard. They all have thick rubber boots. They all have masks. They are protecting themselves. Well, we need to protect our wildlife too. If we want wildlife in our yard, we can't spray and kill them, okay? So look carefully at what sprays there are. Quick story on spraying in my yard. Um, I was uh, taking the Master Gardener class, 2009, just becoming a Master Gardener, learning everything there is to know. And I learned that one of the ways to uh, keep pests, pests out of my yard is specifically aphids, is to use ladybugs. So I went out and I bought ladybugs. The local nursery offered them at the time and I brought home bunches of ladybugs. I put them right in the front yard where all those aphids were. I was so proud of myself. The next day, my pest control man shows up. After he left, within an hour, I had no ladybugs. That was the last time I ever had pest control come to my yard. It was like horrifying to see what it could do, what was being killed by people who I thought were just, what, protecting me from cockroaches only? I don't know. In retrospect, I have no idea what I thought, but please think about that spray. And then we have the lawnmower. 
Did you know that there have been no regulations on carbon emissions from lawnmowers? So running that lawnmower right there um, for one hour is the equivalent of running 40 cars in your yard for one hour. Again, is that what you want? Do you want all those carbon emissions there? The next one, I already told you I lived in the Keys. About every third day during the summer, planes went over dumping gases onto all of us, killing mosquitoes. I never saw a bird on my property the entire time I lived in the Keys. Now, shouldn't I see birds in the Keys? I did not. And, you know, how could anyone survive, any little bird survive the um, mosquito control that was being used there? And the mosquito control or the fly control or the deer fly control that the man on the right hand side is using also affects your wildlife. So think about what you're doing to the air as you work with um, uh, wildlife as you think about who you want, why you want, and how you're going to keep them. So if we look at this, uh, this is a pest management system, and it's probably one of the best practices. Most of our pet management should be cultural, and that's at the bottom. And that's like planting uh, trap plants instead of uh, to help with things like aphids to, for example, you could plant sorghum or sunflowers to help with aphids, right? Because the aphids are going to go there. They're trap plants, right? Or we could have physical or mechanical prevention of, of um, insects that are undesirable. And um, that reminds me, one of the worst tasks I had, but I did it faithfully in New Hampshire, was picking those potato bugs off the potato um, greens and getting them out of the garden. Squish, squish, squish. But that's physical. That's actually moving in and taking um, charge of doing it. Biological, I already told you about my um, ladybugs. That would be a biological solution to um, bugs in the garden. Another example of that are crab spiders. If you look at a crab spider web, you can see all the carcasses that have been wrapped as mummies um, along the web. And that crab spider is enjoying those mosquitoes and keeping them away from you. And the very last thing you need to do is use a chemical to get rid of those insects. I just, uh, this is uh, what I look out on in my backyard. And so I just add carbon se sequestration, think carbon sequestration whenever you can in terms of cleaning air. The more trees we have, the better. Um, what was it? Uh, Climate Envoy, Kerry has recently said, you plan on planting trees, plant five times that many. You need at least five times that many. So air is one of the issues that we have to think of as we attract wildlife. And another one is water. You know, how many different water sources can we think of that would help? Um, just to do a sidestep, because um, I think both Taylor and Wendy had sidesteps about water in their presentation, so I thought I'd copy that approach. Although water covers 71% of the Earth's surface, only 3% is fresh. And then if you look at the bottom, only about 1% of all that water it's drinkable. So when we think we have all this water, we don't have a tremendous amount of drinkable quality water. And you can see the uses also up there. In 
in terms of 10 countries that use the most water, we're number two. Okay. And I think the statistic at the bottom is the one that surprises me. 70% of fresh water is used for agriculture. Just remember that. Where does the water come from? Well, all sorts of um, groundwater sources, but mostly for us, our aquifer system. And where does it go? It doesn't go to a wastewater treatment facility. It goes other places. You see where it goes in uh, your, along your street. And when you see your neighbor blowing leaves into that um, area, it makes me very upset. I should say when I do, it upsets me. Uh, it can go into retention ponds. It can go into Payne's Prairie. Most of it ultimately goes underground and we hope returns to the aquifer. But I did want to mention Sweetwater Wetlands Park because that is a, a way of naturally trying to cleanse the water as it goes through three different ponds moving into Payne's Prairie and after Payne's Prairie, it will move to the aquifer. But we are talking about adding water to the landscape so that we'll um, have more wildlife and bird baths, garden pools, drip pools. Um, there are all sorts of ways that we can begin to add water. This one is our um, three of the ways and a fourth one that I've been told I need to do. So um, my, I have uh, ponds in my backyard, of course, the bird bath. And I want to remind you that rainwater can be captured. It sticks to those plants. And as it sticks to the plants, it also provides water. In the upper left hand corner, I've got sponges. And what I've been told recently is that sponges attract butterflies and uh, they'll get their water from something like a sponge, okay? Rain barrels and rain gardens also supply water and plants hold water. Um, it, it's always, made me question again, what do you want from your garden? I know um, last summer, there were a number of um, comments about how we ought to be out making sure our bromeliads didn't have water in them. And yet, if we want some bugs, if we want some plants, if we want some birds, we need to keep water there and bromeliads hold that water. And also, I just want to remind you that you know, not all insects are pests. Many of them are really helpful in the garden and they help us. You know, think of the assassin bug um, or how about ladybugs or um, uh, what else can I think of right offhand? I'm not going to come up with another one right off. Oh, um, lace wings. You know, there are all sorts of bugs that are really helpful in the garden. Rain gardens, if you have a rain garden that suggests that you have a, a relatively wet area and you can make that um, more appealing to wildlife in many different ways, one is the rain garden. Um, on the bottom left-hand corner, uh, this is kind of my version of a French drain as we look at it. So the one on the uh, bottom left before was part of the rain garden. This one is a French drain where um, the water runs off my roof, waters the plants along the edge of the roof and uh, goes into that French drain. This is my transitional slide. And uh, it reminds me that my backyard has water most of the year in some way, shape or form because I back up to wetland, okay? And in the wetland here on the right hand side, you can see that water. And the other thing that I wanted to mention 
is shelter. And we're moving to that second top, our third topic now, in terms of what protection can we give them. And shelter includes that brush pile. And my brush pile right now is getting pretty darn big and I need to do something about it. But brush piles are important. They um, give shelter to all sorts of creatures. They provide uh, a place to get away. Um, I've seen various animals run into that, or I've also seen them slither into that. So, but everyone needs shelter. These are two other forms. On the left-hand side, it's a bat house that my next door neighbor put up on uh, the wetland right behind his house. And I've looked at other installations of bat houses and I'm not sure that's the best place for his because usually bat houses are more out in the open where there's more ways to get to them quickly. Uh, and I haven't researched that in detail. So if anybody would like to add in the chat something about that, I'd be happy to know more about it. And you can see that I've just recently added my uh, insect uh, <laughs> my bee um, protection in on the right hand side. And that's new. You can see how it still doesn't have anybody living inside, but it will. On the left hand side, there's the reminder. Well, I, if, if I were um, looking at your, your uh, chat right now, I would ask you, when does the flower in front bloom and what's happened in the back? So the front is the golden groundsel. It's in bloom everywhere right now. Um, if you drive down the roads on the uh, banks where there are drain, uh, drainage areas there, you'll see uh, golden groundsel. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Now behind that, in my yard up until yesterday, was uh, the leftover ginger from last year. Yes, it had died back, but I kept it. I kept it because it's a place to hide. I kept it because it's a place that is relatively near a tree, that tree um, birds fly back and forth for the tree and the ginger, and they go back and forth all the time. So it is um, helping shelter my wildlife. <clears throat> I cut it down yesterday and the new is already coming up. You can see it. But people say, oh, how can you stand that? If it were in my front yard, I would have cut that down, but it's not. It's in my backyard. Uh, it offers protection. It offers shelter. A lot of animals use it. And for me, it's the equivalent of Monet's haystack. The light changes on it all the time. The part of the day, you can see it as I get up in the morning, it's always in the shade. But within an hour of my getting up, the sunlight is just beginning to hit it. And, you know, if you like Monet's haystacks, enjoy the leftover ginger in your yard. On the right hand side, there are two things here. One, the leaves. And those leaves don't get raked up by me. Think of everything that can live within those leaves. Often they say that people rake up their leaves, package them up. My across the street neighbor yesterday, or not yesterday, last week had eight lined bags of uh, leaves that she sent off to the, um, the city composting. And it reminded me that I really should have run across the street and gotten eight bags of mulch for free, right? You know, it's uh, quick mulch to use anywhere. And um, over and over, I have uh, read that uh, pupas often are within some of that leaf uh, in the dead leaves. And we don't see them, but they're taken away as the um, leaves are taken away, should we happen to break them. Also, there are violets there. And the violets are the first of the ground covers in my backyard. 
and I'll talk more about that later. So we need a variety of species of native plants, right? Starting with trees and shrubs. Or that's how I started, because I started fresh with my landscape. Uh, the trees went in first, the shrubs went in second, and uh, I built it that way. But keep what you have that's native and see what you can build around it. Use all levels of vegetation from those tall trees. I've got a pine tree that uh, when I moved in, they said, oh, don't you want to uh, uh, cut that pine tree down? And I said, why? And they said, what if it falls on the house? And I was so happy my real estate agent said, that's why she's going to have insurance. Because yes, that pine tree offers shade, it um, offers uh, branches for birds to uh, be on and sing to me in the garden from those branches, etc. And all levels you can see uh, through this garden. Coral bean is there, another native. Uh, the hummingbirds love those red flowers. Uh, between the two is um, uh, wax myrtle. And then you can see I'm moving into shorter plants on the other side and in the foreground. I've already talked to you about my Cooper's hawk. And I began to call um, one of the twins Rude Becky because she ate all my Rudbeckia. And another twin I called Cassia because she took out my Cassia Senna. And you know, they practically come when I call them. Actually, I've only seen them once since about January, so they're moving on. And then we have the box turtle. Um, turtles walk through my yard three or four times during the year. The retention pond is on the other side of the street, a couple of um, houses away. So it's got a long trip from the retention pond to the, um, to the wetland behind my house. However, I'm the only neighbor, uh, I'm the only house in the neighborhood without a back fence. And therefore, creatures can come in and out much more easily with my yard. Okay, ground covers, just a reason for them, some reasons for them and some considerations. I'm into biodiversity, if you haven't figured that out out already. They do feed the pollinators. This is my lineup, okay? My yard in the back starts with violets. Right now, they're beginning to, actually they've come from white to blue violets, and my lyre leaf sage has started coming in. Following this will be clover, okay? So it's not one ground cover, I've got several. All of those are providing um, food for wildlife, nectar, if nothing else. I know another person who um, has wildflowers throughout one whole area in her yard, a ground cover. They do wonderful things. They suppress weeds and they outcompete weeds. Yeah. Um, I once had grass in my backyard, but that was boring. No biodiversity there. Or, sorry, for the St. Augustine grass, it was other grasses offer all sorts of things. Um, it blocks light so that the earth is um, cooler where it has a ground cover and it provides a natural herbicidal effect for some. You've got all sorts of choices for ground covers. You know, don't think that you're limited to one thing. Save those dead trees. If they're standing, um, they may be home for an owl next week. They may, you may find a nest of osprey there in a little while. All sorts of possibilities of who's going to live in that tree. And keep it also if it's down. If it's down, um, you might use it in your agriculture. A little, what is it, culture? I never quite get that pronunciation correct. 
but um, dead trees help with your own uh, growing of plants. Here they are. Taylor loves them. I can tell. Was it Taylor who said, or was it Colin who said that? Those darn. <laughs> but they're. I'm remembering Colin going <laughs> off about these birds. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. There they are. But yeah. <laughs> they're this is actually a, a photograph from um, Sweetwater. However, that's why you have them in your yard. That's why you keep those branches in your yard. Ah, how do you like this shot? My cats are inside cats and they really, really like to watch wildlife. As you can see, this guy has his eye on a rabbit. But look at the um, statistics. Outdoor cats kill. Don't tell me that your outdoor cat never kills because it does. Um, and I, I have evolved as a gardener. I've evolved as a wildlife lover. I'm constantly changing all the time. When I lived in the Florida Keys, my cats were outside cats. Hmm, maybe that added to a reason I didn't have a bird population on my property. And uh, one morning, I remember it was one of those absolutely horrible times when my uh, hunter cat brought me a baby bird. And I'm still in the process of telling that one off when my other cat arrived with another baby bird. And that was the end of my having outdoor cats. I was, uh, that was reinforced when I went to the um, Alachua County Refuge to adopt a cat because I had to sign that I would never let my cats go outside with the uh, Alachua County Animal Rescue. Okay, but remember that, high statistic. All right, we're moving into food. And these are just kind of three questions that you need to think about. How much do we supplement? Do we plan specifically for wildlife and plant for them? And I've talked about my garden evolving. How does yours evolve? And uh, mine, as I say, I like the visitors as much as the plants at this point. I just want to remind you that every plant has a place to be planted. Right plant, right place. You know, you've heard that with every speech you've ever heard at um, Master Gardeners, I'm sure. But it's true. Make sure that you're buying right plants for this zone. And then, if you want wildlife, plant food producing trees and shrubs, right? Um, <clears throat> Holly, my hollies always seem to have berries on them. I remember when I bought my uh, American holly and uh, it was a time of year when there weren't many uh, plants for sale. And I uh, was talking at the farmer's market with uh, the person that I bought it from. And she said, you will find that your birds are drunk during some of the year on this holly tree. It's true. Keep any native plants that you have. There's ironweed on the left, senna on the top right, and on the bottom is the native azalea, the pinkster. <coughs> You've seen a version of this sign, uh, slide before, sorry. For the birds, the berries, but Watch out for your blueberries and strawberries. Now, you may need to start covering them. You may need to do that. Um, and you can supplement. Right now, I've started, uh, just started adding mealy worms to it. I'm not going to talk a lot about birds, but I do want to remind you that birds also um, eat some of those insects that you may be worried about. And uh, you may be attracting them for purposes other than just their beauty. 
And the reason I'm not talking a lot about birds is that I think um, most people who are into birding have already established. And if not, you know, I would go to a good store and have a long talk with the staff and work with them in terms of that. Well, what about squirrels? I'm going to have squirrels in my yard, like it or not. So I might as well like them. I might as well enjoy them. And uh, right now they're having a wonderful time with the pine cones as they drop off the trees. They are shredding them to pieces and going after the very inside of those pine cones to those seeds right in there. Um, but I know that my pear trees will be affected by their eating, uh, their being here. Um, when I moved here, I wanted to, buy, to plant a pecan tree in the backyard. And one person said, don't, just don't do it, Susan. You're on too small a piece of property and one pecan would just be food for squirrels. So I didn't, I took that advice and I see how that works. Um, I know that people with uh, a good orchard really don't have that many squirrels. I'll just mention that. Dragonflies, yeah, I love dragonflies. And being living where I do, it's really nice that I do because in the wetlands, they really enjoy growing. But also in uh, my two ponds, I have water lilies uh, in there so that they can feed there. And um, wild celery, black-eyed Susans. Well, I don't have Rebecca, sorry, you know why. Um, Joe Pieweed works well. Bees, wasps, butterflies, moths. Um, I was telling somebody that I was going to give this presentation and he said, start right off and say, if you're going to spray your yard, do not raise bees, wasps, butterflies, or moths, because if you do, you're going to kill them. And so just remember that you will be killing them if you decide to spray. So these are our pollinators. What is pollination? Probably most of us know that at this point. And why they're important? Well, their benefits are they're an indicator species. That means that when pollinators start not showing up, we need to worry. They indicate something that is wrong with our, um, our whole system. And right now, I'm sure you've heard that uh, bees are having a problem and bees are, are an indicator species. So we are trying to find out what is that problem? Uh, is it that they're overworked because they go from Florida to California to help the almond industry and move around the country? What is it? But they are indicating that something is wrong within our system. Pollinators also provide our food source, and I have a little bit more information on that later. Psychological needs. I really enjoy hearing them in the yard. Um, I don't mind their buzzing as they go by. I've pretty much decided that if I don't bother them, they're not going to bother me. And I do want to say, one of the uh, first learning experiences I had uh, as a master gardener was I brought my um, mentor to see my yard. And my mentor at the end of it said, your yard is too quiet. I didn't know what that meant. But a, a live yard is filled with noises, it's filled with bird calls, it's filled with those animals rustling through the um, grasses, it's filled with the noise of um, bees um, buzzing. It, those, those are really good sounds. And for her, that was something that I needed to work on. And so I have, you know, she's one of the reasons my garden evolved. They are part of the web of life and we have all sorts of financial gains from them. So in terms of crops, bees pollinate 71 of the hundred that are most used, okay? 
And we have all sorts of money that comes into the United States because of that. Lots uh, of bees affect our economy in lots of ways. So who are the pollinators? I'm looking primarily at the ones in green. Um, and I was going to say these are in alphabetical order, but they are not. So I can't say that. Um, but there are lots of pollinators. Some of us pollinate flowers. Some of us work hard to do that. But I've always taken the attitude that um, others can do it better than I. So I've let them. So what are the needs? They need nectar and pollen. They need water. Habitat, hmm, sounds familiar, right? We've been talking about that. And I like these recommendations. Grow more plants and trees, let it go wild. I once was told that if I really wanted uh, wildlife in my backyard, I needed to let it be a little bit messy. I don't cut my grass quite as often as my neighbors do, but remember it's my backyard. And uh, thus I'm avoiding disturbing them, right? And over and over, think about those pesticides. What do you really want? Bees and wasps. You know, this is what I call Mexican sage and I didn't look up the scientific name, sorry. Honeybees. These are pentas, if you don't recognize them, blown up so much. And goldenrod. These, of course, are into the bumblebee family. This is um, a fly. I thought it was a flying ant of some sort, but it's been identified as a fly for me. These are on um, my almond bush, which is a wonderful pollinator. I told you about the pollinator study that um, I was involved with. The people came once a week to count pollinators on my property. So they looked at what species were there and they looked at how many I had. And uh, all that data was helping them assess what needed to be done. One of the things that they said they liked best about my yard is that there is not a time of the year when something is not blooming in my yard. So there are always blossoms. That's always nectar plants there. Tickweed with that bumblebee. Blow him up even bigger. And a wheelie, a wheelie bug in the um, right hand, on the right hand side of the screen. And you can see his wheel on his back if you look closely. Zinnias, so many nectar plants, so many nectar plants, but that makes a good transition to um, butterflies because while nectar plants are gorgeous, Host plants are not. Host plants are eaten. They're eaten so much that uh, they don't always look good. Butterflies also need water, puddling areas, and minerals. Puddling areas might be um, sand, a sandy place in your yard that you just add moisture to, or it's been told to me, and I did check it, that urine is very appealing to butterflies, okay? They're after the nitrates. They're um, after minerals for that. Basking areas, cover and shelter, and nectar. So in many ways, these are like um, all the other species we've looked at. Okay, this is why host plants don't always look good because these caterpillars just have a wonderful time. Now, host plants like milkweed don't always stay where they're planted. And so I must confess that this is in my front yard because that's where the milkweed wanted to grow, okay? 
Okay. So um, my HOA hasn't gotten after me in terms of my monarchs eating my milkweed as of yet, but they may any day. But the point is you need to be willing to see plants eaten. They're going to have holes in them. They're going to be stripped down. Leaves are going to be gone, but it'll be worth it. Just got some um, butterfly photos here and their host plants. So the zebra longwings host plant is in, in the upper right hand corner, the passion vine. This um, is just a second, I have it in my notes. I didn't get it into uh, Florida dusky wing. Okay. And its host plant is locust berry, the Gulf fritillary. I have one mismarked here, so you can all be hunting for it. And the Gulf fritillary's um, host plant is the passion vine again. These are all um, butterflies that I have in my backyard, okay? So that's one way that I thought of organizing this, is letting you see what's there and why they're there. Black swallowtail, you can see the caterpillar on the right-hand side, and carrot family. Eastern tiger swallowtail, black cherry, and sweet bay. Julia, incorrectly labeled. This is a gold fritillary again. And so I apologize for that being mislabeled. A tropical checkered skipper. Ironweed is what I have in my yard that uh, makes him happy. I mentioned that I have wax myrtle before and this is a red banded hair streak. Long-tailed skipper likes milk pea. And here's the milk pea. You know, I didn't even know I had it. But the moment I saw the photograph, I knew I have it all sorts of places. And a common buckeye, this actually was taken at Payne's Prairie. Its host plant is Ruelia and others, right? The oleander moth. I don't have any oleander on my property. My neighbors do, and so I occasionally see it, but it doesn't stay here long. Sphinx moth and fringe tree or cross vine. And I have both of those. Okay, so I've taken a look at what I have and then shown you what, um, comes what is there because of that. The other way I could have done this, and I only started it toward the end of my preparation, is take a look at a plant that really draws in lots of um, butterflies. And the senna is one of those, the Cassia senna is one of those. And so on the left, are the common, sorry, on the right hand side are all the um, sulfur butterflies that come to a, cas a cassia senna, okay. And I mentioned two um, butterflies that come to the Gulf, to the passion vine, and these are others. So I, I really tried to find a Julia in my yard, but couldn't do it for you. Okay. Nectar sources are abundant. These are some of my favorite. Um, butterfly weed. The only thing I'll say about butterfly weed is that I have to replant my tree about four, every four years. It only lasts about four years for me. And I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. The next one's very happy for three or four years. And then next year, got to plant it. Beggar ticks, which are the Biden's close are the ones on the uh, left-hand side here. And uh, because they are usually surrounded by pollinators. I do not pull them. Some people think they're weeds. I absolutely maintain that you have to have some of them on your property. So, um, I've mentioned the Bahama cassia, the butterfly peas, um, 
the fragrant snanchum, scarlet bush, wild lantana, all of those are wonderful nectar sources. Native plants attract pollinators. Yeah. So there are lots of possibilities in terms of what you plant and what will draw pollinators to your yarn. Still more palms, native palms, native grasses, the muley grass, right? Elliot's love grass, purple love grass. The under the native um, ground covers, I think, and I'll check with one of you on that. I believe that sunshine mimosa has been put on the invasive species list. There is one type of mimosa that is invasive, but the other is not. Okay, thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. I'll put I'll put the uh, I'll put the link for the invasive one. The one that stays low and grows as a mat on the ground uh -huh. is the good one. Okay. Um, there's one that wants to grow a little bit more erect, and when I say a little bit more erect, like six to eight inches, so not oh. much. They look very similar. That's the invasive one. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I'll put the IFAS assessment link in the chat box. Great. Also, Susan, um, perennial peanut is not native. Really? Yeah. Thank you, Gail. I did not know that. Thanks. Close, though. South American. <laughs> okay, think globally, act locally. That promoting biodiversity, just some remember uh, things to remember. Yeah. It helps revive the urban ecosystem. One uh, presentation that I went to at one point said that the best thing that you can do for the planet is give wildflower seeds to everyone. So, and I also just wanted to mention that everything that I've said is the same as Florida friendly landscaping principles. So if you follow those Florida friendly landscaping principles, you are going to be um, getting wildlife to come to your yard. You will be planting for them. Also, the National Wildlife Federation uh, certifies yards. And all you have to do is go online, go on for this, and it asks you about what food you offer, what water you offer, what cover crops you have, what cover you have for um, the various wildlife, do they have places to raise young? And do you maintain sustainable practices? You can um, have your yard certified by National Wildlife Federation. Uh, master gardeners also certify yards. Um, however, they are very stringent on invasive species. So if there were an invasive species in my yard, I would not be able to be um, certified. And uh, today I spotted, and it's something I, I have been fighting for the past five years, and I will dig it out one more time. I found asparagus fern and it popped up. And I know that uh, a master gardener would immediately spot that. So what are you willing to do to help preserve our pollinators and our wildlife? Right? What commitment are you willing to make to the environment? And more than anything, I just want to say enjoy planting for wildlife because the plants are wonderful and the creatures that you get to your yard also will be wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, we have a couple questions that I think are that we have in the Q&A. Um, and I think there's a couple talking points I think maybe we can go back to because they popped up quite a few times throughout the presentation. Um, just never at the time was it relevant to something you're speaking about. Um, so I didn't want to interrupt. But um, 
One had to do, uh, it looks like Gail is answering this question right now, but wildflower seeds, when is the ideal time to um, plant or wildflowers? Oh, well, and a good source, a good source. That's always hard to find. <laughs> oh, well, there is a good source. Uh, and it's the source that you have uh, in your files on a planting a wildflower flower garden by Lois McNamara. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's available, right, on YouTube? Yeah, yeah okay. and I have that link actually somewhere that has that because getting the quantity of wildflowers can be can be kind of difficult, but it's possible. Yes, yes. And I think if I remember correctly in um, her presentation, she said, fall, you can do it, or you can do it very early spring. Yeah, like October, I think is the ideal time mm -hmm. or early, early spring. Mm -hmm. yep. And that the recording of that presentation for wildflowers is on our YouTube page and everybody that's registered will get a, a copy of this presentation as well as a um, a, um, a link to our YouTube channel where we'll have a rec recording of this presentation as well. You can access other recordings that we do have. That's a great question. Yeah, um, and I'm pulling up that document just so I can send it to everybody right now. It's just a general, um, fact sheet that we have about creating wildflower meadows. All right, so um, let's see, we have a couple questions that are popping up. So one question that I wanted to bring back up, uh, Susan, had to do with water in the landscape. I know there's always concerns about mosquitoes. Um, what are some of the recommendations that you have for anybody that wants to have like a bird bath or like those little cool butterfly trays, et cetera, but if you haven't, or even rain barrels, yet you're having to deal with mosquitoes. What's your recommendation? Well, um, encourage dragonflies <laughs> to <laughs> yeah. your yard, you know. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if that, well, uh, birds, so many birds will eat mosquitoes too, you know, so that the, and bats, you know, if you have a bat house going and, and they're going to be out there at nighttime enjoying the backyard. So again, um, use chemicals as a last resort. Don't do it before that, you know, just in terms of getting rid of those mosquitoes. I've not had problems um, with Mosquitoes and bromeliads, although, as I said during the presentation, um, some people are very concerned about that. I haven't had problems. Um, what I like, what I recommend is for like any of those bowls or trays, if you're still trying to attract pests yet, or attract pests, you're trying to attract wildlife yet, keep the mosqu mosquitoes at bay, just flush out those, uh, the trays, um, exchange the, change the water out. Um, and just replace it because once you do that you're essentially just removing um, all the mosquito larvae that's in there and you can do that every few days um, and other you know, oh even with the bromeliads you can just spray them with the hose and that just floods the larvae out that's any that's any collecting and that's an easy way to help reduce the larvae that's within the water um and bt tablets um that's a biological control if you have like a rain barrel um that will be a great way to um, you can throw a BT tablet in that helps eliminate larva, but anything that you can move the water that'll disrupt the surface tension and it'll kill the, the larva. So flowing water or bubblers, aerators can do that too. Uh, Taylor, there's a question about how do you wash out a bird bath without chemicals? Uh, what I do is I have a, a brush that I attach to my, my power drill, battery power powder and just scrub it out and wash it out a few times and pour them pour the water out and um, fill it up with clean water and, and the birds really love it and I never ever use chemicals in 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 the bird bath Taylor there's another way to provide water that you can prevent mosquitoes is by having running water um, and Birds Unlimited sells a little appliance that you can attach to your bird feeder that gives a really slow drip of water. And that the birds like it too, 
but the fact that the water is moving keeps the mosquitoes away. Yeah, moving water is one of the, the easiest things. And I know Susan earlier said you like the sounds of bees. I love hearing the sounds of bees because it just sounds like someone's up to doing some hard work around the yard. Um, and uh, that, that sound of moving water psychologically, especially here in Florida, it actually cools you down mentally. So you feel cooler hearing that bubbling water. Those are great ideas. And these are all ways to control them without uh, having to do the chemical pesticides. So let's see, we have a couple other uh, questions. What do you do when the caterpillars devour your milkweed and still look hungry? Like you have that third instar monarch and he's like, I, I, I'm out of food. What do I do? What do you do? <laughs> um, there are uh, people who share their, their, uh, their plants and in such occasions, you know, I'll, I'll go to the next door neighbor and say, hey, yeah, they, yeah, my can I move my, my caterpillar over to your plants? And I will have to say there's a, a site online. Um, darn, I, I can't remember the exact. It's a Facebook site. On, oh, is it Grow Gainesville? Um, I know no, Grow Gainesville. I see people do like, uh, I'm running out of pollinators. Exactly. <laughs> They're there getting go. munched. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, um, I'm running out of uh, milkweed. <laughs> Anybody got extra? And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So plant share i know um some people will like it depends on what the plant is because some of them it's just like you, there's nothing that you can do it can be really hard to find that host plant um some people will move them they'll get their they have those rearing houses that they'll try to move them in there with some additional small plants that are still in a container so they don't have to worry about um um potting them so that that can be a tricky situation um like at the old extension office one time we went and bought dill because the swallowtails destroyed all the dill and they were all over the place and there, there was no dill left. So we went and bought a bunch of dill from the, the market, organic dill to make sure that there was no residual insecticides on it. So <laughs> it didn't work, unfortunately. Um, like the next day they were all gone. So something bigger than they were came along and ate them all. So um so I know you have the PowerPoint slides done, but um, you removed them. But what were some of the plants that you recommend for attracting dragonflies? Oh, I can pull up that if you want to take a look at it again. Um, yeah, let's just take a look again. So the Joe Pye weed, and if you have a pond, yeah, a water lily is so wonderful for that, right? Wild celery. And as uh, Black Eyed Susans, I would love to have Black Eyed Susans. I just uh, have another creature that likes them too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, if, I mean, if you're trying to recreate that habitat, you need to have those. Um, but man, I really like Arrowhead. I like those plants. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good. Did you take my um, stop sharing? Because I was about to. No, I did not. You didn't stop sharing. Did I? Maybe. <laughs> Good question. Hey, um, there's a couple of questions I want to get to, but um, Lois McNamara, I'm just, uh, she put some questions in the Q&A. Um, and I'm just posting those as an answered question so everyone can see. I put a link for that wildflower seed source um, that uh, Lois referenced in that question or statement that she put in that I shared out to everybody um, about planting in late October or November is the best time to sow for most of them. Thank you, Lois. Um, so let's go back to these other questions. 
oh, sorry, there's a follow up survey that I put in the chat box. Um, we use those surveys to help improve our, our programs. Oops, I reposted the wrong one. Um, and those, what we do with those is um, you fill out the survey, just takes a couple seconds and allows us to kind of make sure that we're always improving our program. So we do this after all of each program that we do. So if, please take a few minutes and leave uh, and fill that out. Um, and we'll follow up with our email after the program with that link again, in case you miss it. So uh, let's see. Ooh, bat houses. There's been a lot of discussion about bats. So, um, of course, I think all of us are missing that we, you know, I know Luby Bat Fest had the, um, the virtual Bat Fest this year. And I know we're all looking forward to getting back to the in-person Bat Fest in the future. But with regards to bats, do you all have, like, what, have you built your own bat house or um have you do you know any places that you can get like prefabricated bat houses i'm not i have never built one let's start with that and uh <laughs> prefab sounds good to me oh, that's nice <laughs> so there is i will tell you what um they like those really small places they like to go right through the the you know between two two boards or two anything and when i lived in new hampshire um i was in an old uh farmhouse that uh had a sliding door um the, to the barn and so i was there and the door was heavy and i gave it a push and i leaned forward at that time to give it all my energy and there it was <laughs> bat who was living on the back side of that barn door oh my goodness <laughs> they, they like those small spaces <laughs> um i i put in the link there's a bat conservation international they actually have free like design plans to build a bat house and you can always find like bat house kits um i'm not sure but like part of me thinks that maybe wild birds unlimited they have some um and you and I've I've actually seen them at like um, the feed and seed store before. Now I, that's I think that was lucky that I found it there that day. But um, I've seen it at big box stores. They're not too difficult to find. So, um, but placement I think is important. But I'm not 100. percent They do have preferred places to be. But I do think that's one thing is like cabbage palm. Um, sorry, I'm bouncing around all the place all of a sudden. Cabbage palm, our native palm um that's a great place for bats so you know we all the, you always seen them prune but if you just let the if you just let that boot grow and you just let those dead fronds hang whoo that's a bat haven so wildlife haven not just bats so those are wonderful uh, let's see um Oh yeah, someone said they're pretty sure that wild birds has bat houses. Thank you. Um, what is a natural way to get rid of spiders? Oh, why? Well, why? I think I think one of the control concerns is if black widows oh. and like brown recluse. Like I have a scar on my elbow from a brown recluse bite. That wasn't very pleasant um, back when I was in high school. But uh, that those are always concerned, of course like black like spiders are amazing like oh my gosh i have a huntsman spider that lives on my back patio that thing scares me but we just call him frank and he manages all the bugs outside on her patio <laughs> um but um there are always, always a concern of having some of the venomous spiders within our homes or those areas where you might have kids or something like that fumbling around so spider control inside of houses i'm not in entirely sure but out in the garden i don't know if there's any natural spider controls do you all know of any well there are various wasps that will uh that will them. take mm -hmm. care of widows also birds of course uh, we've got several birds that have no problem with the type of spider and uh praying mantis uh mm -hmm. and i know you can bring those in, in, into your yard if you need to on occasion uh, to, to help keep the population down. A friend of mine had a similar issue and he found the praying mantis as his solution. And then they went off and found other places once, uh, 
once their food source had been severely diminished. <laughs> so, yeah. But th those are the only ones I'm aware of. Yeah. Fair enough. And I would say it, it's kind of like snakes. You want to know what snake it is. You want to know what spider it is before you do away with it, right? Absolutely. Um, and there's one other question that says, I wonder what the status of Africanized bees are here in Florida. So yes, Africanized bees we do have in Florida. I think they're primarily in South Florida. Um, but I know there's, there's constant like, um, there's like ways to help protect yourself from them. Um, but here in Alachua County, I don't know if we have, I don't know if I've ever heard any of any Africanized bee colonies. Doesn't mean they haven't existed. Um, but the biggest thing is like, you're gonna see them in like, you can find them in trees, but you can find them in garages, sheds, outhouses, or like outbuildings, not outhouses, um, crawl spaces, water meters. So it's just a matter of making sure that when you're dealing or if you want to try to prevent any unwanted pest or any kind of Africanized bee, um, there's that goes back to the IPM method uh, that Susan was talking about, those cultural and mechanical controls are like, what are those preventative things that you can do that take away, um, that take away your home being an attractive place for some of those pests to, to make their home with. And thank you, Christy, for putting that link in the chat box. Sure. That's, a, that's a good one. So, and I think it's important is Africanized bees get a bad rep. They're still bees. They're defensive. They're not aggressive. So thanks 1960 bee movies. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> I think actually in that publication that you shared, Christy, it talks about that. It that. does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see, see, even scientists have humor. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's, it's odd and rare. Well, you know. <laughs> Take um, it where I, I can get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about fire ants. So fire ants popped up as a question. We had a question earlier, but like uh, Christy and Susan, do y'all want to talk a little bit about some of the fire ant controls or because it's, those are the unwanted pests in our landscape. Christy, I'll pass it off to you. Uh, well, I don't have... I'm not having the best luck with mine right now. So I've been no in an does. experimental <laughs> stage uh, of trying to get a, a couple of mounds addressed in my backyard um, because I refuse to use chemicals. I, I, I've got too much other wildlife that I enjoy having around. Um, boiling water does help. Uh, it, helps. it diminishes, <laughs> yeah, but that mound will, it'll show up smaller, but it'll show up smaller, uh, you know, a short space away uh, within a few days. So it doesn't completely eradicate. And I honestly just don't have time to sit out there and pour a while boiling water every time something shows up. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't know. I'm ants are not my forte. Yeah. Um <laughs> So, yeah, because, I mean, they're an invasive species. Well, the fire ant is. So all other ants, you know, the only ones you have to concern yourself with are oh. ones that would destroy. Is there but, any yeah. kind of bait that might work for fire ants specifically? Something that, I mean, that isn't going to bother other things? Some not sort of that I work? Not that I can think of, because most of the stuff yeah. that you can get is bifenthrin. Yeah. which is um, non-selective insecticide. Um, you know, if you want to go more of the organic or biological control, citrus oil does have benefits, impacts on, uh, it can help against uh, yeah. fire ant population. So that's the tough yeah. thing about these guys is just, just they're so tough. I need to line the mound with all my citrus rinds. <laughs> yeah, see, <laughs> to see if that works. <laughs> I don't know if it'll work that well, but you can get like a concentrated citrus oil that you sure. you dilute like you would any type of like fungicide, insecticide or anything like that um, based off of the recommended rate and apply it. So, um, but yeah, there's, we have an EDIS publication about um, organic methods of pest control within a garden landscape and citrus oil actually is listed on that document for fire ant control. It was neat. So it's like, all right, let's try that. Let's try that. <laughs> Anything's possible. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. So yeah, and the hardest thing is to mention is this fire ants are invasive. So it just makes it right. makes it tough. Um, you know, we have crazy ants. Um, they're they're invasive also. Um, and we do have them here in Alachua County. So I haven't mm-hmm. encountered any yet. If you go to Sea oh, Leon Oak, they're there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is a question about the status of the mite and fungus problems plaguing honeybees. So that's not just Florida, that is just globally pretty much, but unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, Tatiana Sanchez in her office, she is the ideal person. We also have the bee lab on US campus. They can help answer that question. But literally Tatiana walked out of the office like five minutes ago. <laughs> so, um, um, But I think that could be something worth looking up at the bee college or the bee research facility as part of extension on US campus will definitely be able to help answer that question because I'm not 100% sure. Let's see. I know we mentioned the, the praying mantis. Can you order praying mantis or buy praying mantis like you can? Do you, you know? Can. I, I don't have my sites on hand for me. I, honestly didn't think this was a topic that would come up I should have known better I uh, <laughs> should be prepared for everything <laughs> um, I, I can dig that up and, and provide a link but really there are several places just find a trusted source uh, you know if you can if you can find a, for, uh, a source that you trust to buy ladybugs from they will probably have prey mantis as well or you know uh, other natural critters Uh, it's quite common and quite easy to find just look for somebody that's closer to home the less they have to travel the better i'd be more afraid of the i'd be more afraid of the praying mantis than than whatever i was trying to control (laughs) i i give them a wide berth yeah you know i (laughs) set them out there say have your fun and (laughs) I'm, I'm looking it up because there's very there are some praying mantis that you can get that are um i don't know if i can they're considered invasive but they um they disrupt our nat our native praying mantis population and yeah, I'm that's why to, you want to go with the local source try to stay yeah, in state yeah so um but i I'm, I'm currently trying to find all the information but i can't find it off the top of my head so uh, Taylor, with regard quickly. to the, the bee diseases question, I, yes. I would should point out on May 4th, we have a program on this wow. the same session Thanks, on Colin. beekeeping for beginners with from Janice. And uh, it may be appropriate to pose that question to her to in- make sure she includes that oh, absolutely. in yeah. her presentation. That's, that's really good because Janice is a beekeeper. Yep. Um, a phenomenal one at that. So yeah, May. Sorry, I completely forgot about that. That's and the other thing May program that that is a, a national import. There there have been some changes in the law with regard to treatment of the uh, mites, etc., uh, that invade bees. And now, uh, to get the appropriate drugs, you need to have a veterinarian who is. A licensed veterinarian who can uh, pro- uh, provide the drugs, and a number of veterinarians are now getting very much up to speed with regard to uh, treatment and a prescribing of, of therapy oh, wow. for bee colonies. Wow. And a number of, of, of veterinary schools around the country and indeed around the world, uh, in recognition of the, the, the bee decline, are. Uh, uh, making this an important part of their curriculum. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And that's coming from a vet. <laughs> well, uh, for what it's worth. That's wonderful. I never learned about bees, but there are a lot of vets who now do. And it's yeah. become a very interesting and fascinating topic. Yeah. And um, I know Susan spoke a lot about like, how are you managing pests in the landscape? Because it can disrupt those natural pollinators that you want. Um, it's still important just because it's organic doesn't mean it's safe for pests so, or for insects. So make sure that you read the label um, because the label is the law in the state of Florida. Um, like one example of one is like spinosad. That is an organic um, 
insecticide and it can have impacts on um, some of our bee populations. So just make sure that you read the label accordingly. So, cause the label is the law for all pesticides because we want to attract all the wildlife to our landscapes. So not just one specific one. Well, I mean, you don't want them all because you don't want to turn your, um, your yard to a zoo, but nonetheless, um, attracting them to our landscapes is incredibly beneficial, especially we start thinking about habitat fragmentation and the role that we can play in helping preserve or at least have habitat available for our flora and fauna throughout the state of Florida. Taylor, there was a question in the, um, in the chat box about deer ticks and leaving them on the lawn. Uh, they, uh, it's, it's theoretically possible but um, uh, ticks mostly drop off in, in, in the rougher vegetation. And if lawns are mowed regularly and, and uh, looked after, there, there's, there, from what I've learned about the deer, uh, ticks, um, it's not going to be a, a major issue for, on the lawn per se, but uh, it's in the rougher, in the rougher and un, unkempt portion, portions of uh, where things go and, and, and mice and, and all sorts of other small mammals are the intermediate hosts and, and um, uh, ticks, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of emerging diseases and major diseases like Lyme disease that we never used to see here in, in years ago, I never saw here in Florida, but with climate change, all sorts of new things are happening and it's really good to be tuned in to uh, what happens with it if, if you do get a deer tick bite and, and or a tick bite and to look at the little target things that come and, and to consult a physician because um, none of us want to get the, uh, the diseases that, uh, that ticks spread. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, but I think that's it for all the questions that we have. Um, but I wanna thank everybody for joining us today and we'll follow up with all of this content. Um, so thanks everybody again, uh, we really appreciate it and stay tuned for all of our upcoming programs because we are having them on the first and third Tuesday of every month from four to 5.30. So um, sign up and we'll be doing this and eventually um, we'll have like a combination of in-person and remote. So it's like the same class, but we have some opportunity to come in person, but that's not gonna happen until post summer. But anyways, thank you all very much. And thanks again to Susan for doing this. Yay, Susan. Yeah. Hey.